Um, so it's my great pleasure to announce the nanomedicine session of the symposium and my great honor to introduce the next keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Shapiro. Uh, so Dr. Shapiro started his uh, academic career at Brown University, where he majored in uh, neuroscience. He then moved to MIT, where he obtained his uh, PhD in the groups of Robert Langer and uh, Dr. Jessenov. And here he developed biosensors that respond to magnetic fields. And he showed that these sensors have many advantages over the more traditional light-based sensors, such as better tissue penetration. Um, encouraged by these results, he then moved to Berkeley. And here he started using ultrasound to not only image, but also control living systems. And currently, he has his own and very successful lab at Caltech, where he's combining these two approaches. And I'm sure we'll see many nice examples today. So without further ado, I would like to uh, ask him to join the stage. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Dahi, Willem, and colleagues for inviting me. It's really a big um, pleasure and honor to be here. Um, thank you also for putting my talk after Denis Lebian and uh, Simon Cherry. I don't think my uh, mind cone is quite big enough to uh, uh, fit in uh, with this group, but I'll, I'll, I will do my best. Um, and uh, what I'd like to tell you about today um, is work that we're doing my, in my group that's focused on um, imaging and controlling the function of specific cells uh, inside the body. And this is really motivated by two things. Uh, first of all, by basic biology, uh, because whether we're talking about neurons in our brains or microbes in our guts or immune cells patrolling uh, the rest of our body, um, to really understand how these cells work, we want to study it within the context of intact organisms and all the different tissues and cell types and anatomy uh, that's present there and not just under a microscope. And I, I know that many people in this audience um, that's preaching to the choir. Um, in addition, we're quite interested in the development of cells as uh, diagnostic and therapeutic agents. Um, and that's because if we you know, think about what cells can do compared to a, a, a simple molecule, um, they can be much more sophisticated. Cells can migrate through our bodies. They can sense molecular signals. We can engineer them with synthetic biology uh, to perform computations and logic operations based on those signals, and then to take actions like releasing uh, drugs or killing um, other cells or making more of themselves or self-destructing, et cetera. Um, and we've all seen some really beautiful recent successes in the development of cell-based therapeutics, for example, with uh, immunotherapy, where we can take out immune cells uh, from cancer patients, genetically modify them to express receptors that can better target specific uh, epitopes on the tumors, and then send them back in to the patient to go and, and kill those tumors. Or engineered probiotics, where uh, people are making bacteria that are similar to the ones we eat in our yogurt, but now have been genetically modified so they can do things like go through our gut, detect inflammation, and release anti-inflammatory um, compounds. And I think one of the challenges with these cell-based therapeutics today is, is that after we inject these, these uh, very sophisticated agents into our bodies, we don't have very good ways to see where are they. Are they alive? Are they doing what we program them to do? And we also don't have very good ways to tell them what to do based on their location. Um, the reason this is challenging is because if we think about our most sophisticated tools for interacting with cells, um, it's things that work great under a microscope. Right? It's, it's things like fluorescent proteins um, or optogenetics, whose function can be controlled with light, which derive a lot of their power from the fact that they're genetically encodable, meaning we can put it into the genome of cells, and that gives us this very intimate connection to what the cells are doing. Um, of course, the problem with light is that it gets scattered within about a millimeter uh, in tissues, and so it's difficult to scale these optical molecular technologies uh, into larger organisms. While at the same time, we have beautiful uh, technologies like ultrasound and magnetic resonance that use these more penetrant forms of energy, sound waves and magnetic fields, and can give us beautiful images like this one of the brain, but for the most part have not yet been as well connected um, to what happens in specific cells. Uh, and so what we try to do in my lab is to take the physics of sound waves and magnetic fields and to extend these technologies down to the molecular level and cellular level uh, through biomolecular engineering, which means that we find, we engineer, and we evolve uh, proteins or other genetically encodable materials that, instead of interacting with photons, uh, can interact with sound waves and magnetic fields. Um, and quite literally, the research in our lab breaks down into sound waves, ultrasound, and uh, magnetic fields for magnetic resonance and, and other magnetic things, um, and imaging and controlling cell function. And what I'd like to tell you about today is, uh, for obvious reasons, on the imaging side of things. Um, and I'm going to start out um, by talking mostly about ultrasound, because I think that's probably something this audience is less familiar with, 
And then I'm going to finish by talking about a few things uh, for MRI. So, um, you know, why are we interested in ultrasound? And, and um, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, I, I grew up doing magnetic resonance. And I always thought, oh, ultrasound is just for babies, right? Not, the, not that interesting. But actually, I, I've changed my mind. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's a very simple uh, technique, right? It's just sound waves going in and uh, getting scattered or, or reflected off of interfaces with different mechanical properties. Um, but it's also a very, very um, high performance technique. So, you know, we know we can get images like this one of babies, but actually without very much effort in our lab with conventional ultrasound techniques, we get spatial resolution better than 100 microns, centimeters deep uh, into tissues. The temporal resolution is phenomenal. It's just limited by how long it takes the sound waves to travel in and out. At 1,500 meters per second, we're talking about tens of microseconds. Um, and one beautiful illustration of what modern ultrasound can do is from our collaborators in Paris, uh, Mikhail Tanter's uh, group, where what you're looking at here is a rat brain in cross-section, and what we're seeing is this microvasculature within this rat brain resolved at seven micron spatial resolution, okay, throughout the se several centimeter sized uh, volume, um, and this is using a super resolution approach that's analogous to what's been used in optics, okay, so modern ultrasound is capable of doing quite a lot. Of course, here, we're looking at anatomy and we want to get towards uh, cellular function, and so the closest thing to that that existed previously are these dyes for ultrasound contrast agents uh, called microbubbles, which are used clinically. And as the name suggests, these are micron-sized bubbles of gas that are stabilized by typically a lipid shell. Um, and because they are of a lower density than water and water-based uh, tissues, if you inject them into the bloodstream, it helps you visualize blood vessels and look at cardiac uh, function. Um, and in fact, it was used in this study to enhance the contrast from, uh, from this vasculature. And so the question we asked a few years ago was, can cells make something like this? Okay, and we're talking about crazy ideas before. Um, you know, this might also sound to you like a crazy idea because, well, these bubbles are the size of a cell. They're physically, fundamentally an unstable structure. Um, so what kind of cells would be making something like a bubble? But it turns out that over its billions of years, um, evolution has had to solve all kinds of very interesting problems. And in this case, we found what we needed from organisms that live in these kind of bodies of water. These are the South Bay salt ponds near San Francisco. And the color in these bodies of water comes from photosynthetic microbes that live there that use sunlight for energy and had to evolve a way to regulate their buoyancy so they can always be near the top of the water and get enough photons uh, for, uh, for photosynthesis. And the way they evolved to do that is by forming these really beautiful intracellular self-assembled protein nanostructures they're called gas vesicles, but it's actually a misnomer because there's no lipid. It's completely a protein shelled structure. This is an example of one of these structures that we've isolated from uh, a, a bacterial cell. And this is looking at it under TEM. So we can see that it's a few hundred nanometers in size. And what's special about this protein structure is that it's hollow and filled with gas. Okay? So these gas vesicles have a two nanometer thick protein shell that excludes water from the interior, but allows gases to go in and out. So whatever gas is dissolved in the surrounding media will partition in and out according to its Oswald coefficients, just like at this air-water interface. Um, and as a result, you get the structure that is of a uh, lower density. And when these cells want to float higher, they turn on the set of genes that encode the formation of these nanostructures and float higher. And when they want to sink, they can just break them down with proteases. Okay? So to me, it's, it's just kind of a remarkable piece of evolution because if you ask me as a chemical engineer to make you a nano-sized bubble, I would say, no, 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 that's like very difficult, it's unstable. But nature figured out a way to do that by essentially saying, I'm not going to make a bubble. I'm going to make a solid structure, but, but I'm going to make it so thin that it's still going to be mostly air. Um, and uh, this is uh, just some more images of these nanostructures. Um, you can see that they're quite monodispersed in their diameter, um, have some polydispersity in length. And then we can also break them with pressure. And this is what it looks like when they've collapsed. Um, so you can appreciate it. It's just this really thin protein shell. And so we looked at this and we said, OK, well, we have a genetically encoded um, air-filled structure. Maybe we could see it with ultrasound. And luckily for us, uh, this worked out really well. Uh, so I'm going to show you a few images that look like this where we've incorporated, in this case, purified proteins. Later on, I'll show you cells into hydrogels, which are more or less acoustically transparent. And now we were able to see ultrasound contrast coming from picomolar concentrations 
um, of these protein nanostructures. Okay, so this is very exciting. Um, and of course, one of the first things we wanted to do is to say, well, can we see it in an animal? So we grabbed the mouse uh, and started injecting gas vesicles and doing ultrasound imaging. And if you just take nanostructures that are not functionalized with anything in particular and inject them, a lot of them are going to get taken up by the liver. And so we're going to watch liver, the liver here as we're doing our injection. And it's going to go from being dark to over time now accumulating ultrasound contrast. Okay, can everybody see that? Um, and of course here we're kind of uh, cheating because we know when we're doing the injection. If I just showed you an image like this one, how would you know if the contrast is coming from gas vesicles or from something else? that's going on in the liver. And so here we can take advantage of the fact that we can collapse these structures with pressure. And when we do that, the gas inside of them dissolves within a millisecond. Okay, so the contrast should be gone. And so we can do that with acoustic pressure. So all we have to do is at a certain point just crank up our ultrasound a little bit. Let's watch the liver here. Bam. And the signal gets erased. Okay, and because that happened at a particular pressure, we can assign it to uh, the presence of these uh, proteins. Now, these are the first acoustic proteins, and in our lab, we take a lot of inspiration from the history of fluorescent proteins. Um, because um, when they were first cloned from jellyfish, there were all these very basic physical and chemistry questions like, why is it green? And how do you make it blue? How do you make it brighter? What are the chemical conditions required for the chromophore to fold? That by studying those basic questions ultimately gave rise to things that basic biologists use all over the world, like multicolor fluorescent imaging, functional imaging where you, you, you can have dynamic uh, changes in fluorescence in response to things like calcium in the brain here, um, or even actuation where you can get proteins to assemble with each other uh, in response to light. Um, and over the last few years, we've had a lot of fun um, studying the basic kind of physics and genetics and chemistry of these acoustic uh, proteins. In our case, we're not talking about chromophores and excited states, we're talking about mechanics. Okay? And we're engineering at the genetic level, but we're engineering the mechanics of these structures. And then we're developing ultrasound approaches that allow us to maximize the signal that we can get, get out of these things and distinguish them from background, and then apply them in, in various kinds of cells. And I'm just going to give you a, a few examples of, of, of how that's going. So one of the first things we wanted to do um, is to start messing around with the protein sequences uh, and see what would happen. And the gas vesicles are, are, are made of, uh, depending on which organism they come from, roughly 10 genes that all have to be expressed and work together to assemble the structure. But there are two key proteins that make up most of the structure. One of them, GVPA, makes up most of the shell. It's repeated in a crystalline way. And then there's the second protein, gas vesicle protein C, or GVPC, that sits on the outside and acts as a mechanical stiffener. Okay, so it's repeated like bars in an air, airplane uh, fuselage. And uh, we had a convenient way to play with it because we can prepare these gas vesicles, we can chemically strip away their GVPC, and then make new versions of it in bacteria, recombinantly express them, and put them back on the surface of this um, uh, particle. Um, and the kind of things we saw when we do that turned out to be really interesting. For example, depending on whether we have GVPC present or different versions of it where we, for example, truncated its length, we can have nanostructures that look identical under TEM, but require different amounts of pressure for them to collapse. Okay? Now, this allows us to do a form of multiplexing where we can have a mixed population of gas vesicles where they collapse at different pressures, take an image, apply a pressure that's going to selectively collapse the weakest subpopulation, take another image, then apply a pressure that's going to collapse the next weakest, take another image, and so on, and from that reconstruct uh, the uh, different populations. Now, you can see it's not going to work perfectly because there's some overlap in these collapse curves, but if we know at any given pressure, pressure what fraction of each type of gas vesicle should collapse, then it becomes a simple linear algebra problem similar to spectral uh, unmixing and allows us to obtain, in this case, three different colors of contrast. Now, perhaps even more, more interesting and very useful, uh, as it turns out, is the fact that when you make these gas vesicles less stiff, by taking away this hardening protein or, or manipulating that protein, they start to exhibit nonlinear acoustic behavior. So one manifestation of that is if we have our normal gas vesicle and we transmit here at a fundamental frequency of uh, four, four point something megahertz, the signal we get back shown in purple here just contains that frequency. But if we have something that is less stiff, then in addition to our fundamental frequency, we start to see harmonics. So in this case, we're looking at the second harmonic, and if we have greater bandwidth, we can see more harmonics. To understand where this comes from, we can do some finite element mechanical modeling. And so here, we're looking at a single gas vesicle responding to six cycles of a sound wave. And we saw this remarkable buckling and unbuckling behavior. 
Okay? And what that does is converts our nice sinusoidal input into a set of step changes occurring at the input frequency, which very naturally gives rise, if you do a Fourier transform of that, of uh, these different harmonics. Furthermore, because this buckling has a threshold associated with it, so you need to be above a, a particular pressure for, for it to start occurring, we can take advantage of that by developing ultrasound pulse sequences where we modulate the amplitude of our input pulse and get signal that where we can subtract away all the linear uh, behaving scatterers. Um, so if we do normal imaging, we can't tell, tell apart our harmonic gas vesicles from linear scatterers. But when we implement this amplitude modulation strategy, now we can see very specifically the signal from our gas vesicles, which is great for, for in vivo imaging because most tissue scatters linearly. And so it helps us tell apart our contrast from everything else that's present there. Now, uh, while we're playing around with the surface protein, you know, it's kind of like playing Legos where we can attach different functionalities uh, to that surface. So we can do things like change the surface charge. We can add targeting groups to, uh, for example, RGD to um, go to tumor cells uh, or uh, uh, create cloaking signals like this don't eat me CD47 signal. Um, and of course, do chemical modifications as well. But so far, what I've told you about is imaging these uh, genetically derived particles. But what I actually advertised in the beginning is that we're going to be imaging cells and gene expression. So meaning we want to use these acoustic proteins the same way that people use GFP. And so when we started doing that, we initially wanted to do it in bacteria, right? So take the genetic program that makes gas vesicles and put them into microbes that we might want to image, for example, in the gut. And the reason we were interested in the gut is because we all know that the microbiome is really important, and every week there's you know, high-profile studies uh, showing um, that it's important in different functions. What is not as appreciated is that most of what we know about the microbiome comes from studying one particular type of sample, namely poop, uh, which is not very representative of the spatial geography of what's happening in the gastrointestinal tract, where people have actually looked, by invasive methods, the composition in terms of the bacteria in our small intestine and large intestine is totally different. And even within a given stretch of the intestine, if you look as a function of how close you are to the wall, you have very different bacterial populations doing different things. So if we want to study them, we want to do it within the in vivo context and not just by looking at feces. Uh, in addition, we and others in the synthetic biology community are interested in developing microbes as therapeutic uh, agents. And I already mentioned how that could be used in the GI tract, for example, for treating inflammation. But people have also made bacteria that can uh, home to tumors um, and, and other specific sites in the body. And we want to image where they are. So we said, OK, let's just take all the genes that encode gas vesicles in our favorite cyanobacteria, move it into E. coli as a starting point, and see what happens. It turned out to be much more difficult than we anticipated. Um, not many people have tried to move this number of genes from one organism uh, to another. And it turned out that when we did that with our cyanobacterium, it just didn't work. So that was disappointing. Then we said, OK, let's look at the closest genetic relative of E. coli that contains gas vesicle genes in its genome and try those. And when we did that by taking genes from Bacillus megatherium, now we started to form gas vesicles. So we'll see a few of these images of whole cells with all, this TM with all those little splotches in there are gas vesicles. We can also lyse the cells and look, look at what the structures look like. Um, and so this is exciting. But unfortunately, when we put these cells into ultrasound, we didn't see any contrast. And that's because we think these structures, although they're gas vesicles, they're these tiny little ones that are not good at scattering sound waves. OK, so then we said, OK, let's try to mix and match. Let's take almost all the genes from bacillus that we know can make gas vesicle and combine it with the key structural genes that I already told you about earlier, GVPA and GVPC, from our, our cyanobacterium, where we know they can form nice gas vesicles and see if this Frankenstein gene cluster that mixes and matches can work. And when we did that, we started to see nanostructures formed in these cells that were larger. And for the first time, we can now see live gene expression in engineered cells happening with ultrasound. We can optimize the gene cluster a little bit to get us really nice looking gas vesicles, strong uh, ultrasound uh, contrast, and we call this genetic construct ARG1 or acoustic reporter gene 1. And if we really push this uh, expression, this is what it looks like in these cells. So we have here an E. coli where all these little things here is so just full of gas vesicles. Now, before you feel uncomfortable for, on behalf of the E. coli, uh, keep in mind the TEM is a 2D projection. Uh, modality. Um, and uh, we don't need to push it quite this far uh, to get ultrasound contrast. Uh, but what's fun is that we can make uh, E. coli float. Um, and we've had um, 
undergrads from all over the world writing us because they want to do it for various fun projects. Uh, but more importantly for us, now we can use it as a reporter gene. And what that means is that we can do the kind of experiment that has been done like thousands of times, probably ten, tens or even hundreds of thousands of times with fluorescent proteins, where you connect the gene signal that you have to some genetic circuit. And in this case, we pick the simplest circuit where we're connecting it to uh, sensing a sugar um, and see if we can get the same kind of transfer function between the genetic circuit input and the signal output. And the answer is yes. So as a function of the sugar concentration, we get increasing amounts of ultrasound contrast. Um, and it's actually quite sensitive. So uh, as of this paper, our detection limit was about 100 cells per voxel. In this case, the voxel size is about 100 microns uh, on the side, um, which puts us within the range that's relevant for a lot of gastrointestinal uh, applications. But of course, we want to uh, improve it further for, for less populous uh, microbes. Uh, and so how does this look in vivo? Uh, so as a proof of concept, we took these E. coli. We're actually using a strain that's approved in Europe as a probiotic. Now it's expressing the gas vesicles. We're introducing it into the colon. And we did a comparison between ultrasound and luminescence, which is relevant for a lot of basic bio studies, where we put in the bacteria into the colon uh, as a mixture. So towards the outside of the colon, we have our acoustic reporter expressing bacteria. And in the middle, we have luminescent uh, expressing bacteria. We take an ultrasound image and we see the expected pattern where the ultrasound contrast is towards the, the perimeter. Then we can invert this arrangement and have our ultrasound contrast be towards the middle and it shows up under ultrasound. And then we can look at both of these animals under luminescence. Okay? And when we do that, we see that yes, we can see that there's, that there's contrast there, but we can't tell where it's coming from. Okay? And that's the utility of ultrasound, even when we're talking about small mouse uh, imaging, is that now with 100 micron resolution, you can see where things are. So this was great, um, but you know, kind of for, to really fulfill the promise as a reporter gene, it, it can't just work in bacteria. Right? People want to image human cells, immune cells, neurons, et cetera. And so we undertook um, the challenge of, of transplanting this genetic machinery to human cells. And um, you know, we didn't know if we could succeed because um, you know, I, I think the largest number of genes people had moved between these domains of life was something like four or five. And in this case, it's particularly hard because these genes make protein products where each of them has to fold and function properly. They have to find each other inside the cell. They have to be at the correct stoichiometries relative to each other and then assemble into these kind of nanostructures. Um, luckily, at, at Caltech, we have some pretty courageous slash uh, crazy uh, graduate students um, who took on this problem. And I'm going to summarize four years of work by showing this gene cluster um, that um, we were able to put together where we took these bacterial genes and used tricks from viruses to s stitch these genes together, because viruses also want to deliver genes into us in a very compact way, uh, stitch these genes together so they'd have the correct stoichiometries, where when you introduce this set of genes into uh, mammalian cells, now you can get gas vesicles formed inside those cells. So this is a TEM image where, where we do thin section EM of the cells. We see the gas vesicles in there. And more importantly, now we can see ultrasound contrast. And so here we do the same kind of experiment, uh, the mammalian version where we have a, genetic, a simple genetic circuit. We can see gene expression with ultrasound here in vitro. We can follow the kinetics of gene expression. And the uh, quantity of cells that needs to be there for us to see it is actually quite modest. So uh, currently, we require about a 0.5% volume fraction of cells to be in a particular tissue. So even if, if your cells are a relatively uh, small contributor to the tissue, uh, we're able to see the ultrasound contrast. Um, and uh, in vivo, we do a simple demonstration with uh, subcutane subcutaneous tumor xenografts in mice. Here we have our acoustic expressing tumor. Here we have our fluorescence expressing tumor. We expect most of the expression in these immature tumors to be around the periphery where we have best vascularization. Um, when we take ultrasound images of the fluorescent side, we don't see any ultrasound contrast. When we take uh, images of our acoustic side, we see this nice nonlinear contrast that seems to be at the periphery of the tumor. And we can confirm that histologically. Okay, so here, ultrasound is showing us something that otherwise would take histology um, to, be able to, um, to be able to look at. Now, uh, so this is great, but in both of these cases, these are static sensors. They're just the reporters, meaning that, that they're telling us where they are and wh when the cells are making them. But one of the other beautiful things that people did with uh, fluorescence is making dynamic molecular sensors. And there's a 
whole host of sensors for ions like zinc or calcium, for protease activity, for, for subcellular localization, et cetera. And we want to be able to do that with ultrasound in vivo. And so I want to show you just one very brief example of how we can do that. That is by taking that same external protein I told you about earlier, GVPC, which determines whether the gas vesicles can produce nonlinear ultrasound contrast, and engineering it genetically to be recognized, in this case, by proteases, so we can sense enzymatic activity. So for example, if we put in some, a sequence that's recognized by a processive protease, then in the presence of that protease, it'll bind to this protein and chew it up like a spaghetti. And when that happens, we go from having no nonlinear contrast to now having very strong nonlinear contrast. So we can dynamically sense the activity of this enzyme. We can also do it with an endopeptidase, which cuts in the middle uh, of proteins. And here we're using a model uh, 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 protease TEV. And by engineering a sequence into GVPC that gets recognized by this enzyme, we can detect its activity as well by looking at this nonlinear uh, kind of contrast. Now, uh, the last thing I want to say about uh, gas vesicles and ultrasound is um, coming from Caltech, I am uh, contractually obligated to mention directed evolution uh, since my colleague Francis Arnold just won the Nobel Prize for it uh, this fall. Um, and directed evolution, which is a process of making random mutations in proteins and screening many variants at the same time and having them sequentially accumulate beneficial mutations towards the function that you're looking for is something that's worked beautifully well for enzymes, it also worked beautifully well for fluorescent proteins. A lot of the different colors that we see is because people screened random mutations to see what would be redder, what would be bluer, um, et cetera. Um, and we're doing that for ultrasound. So here uh, is an example where we have these bacterial agar plates where all those little colonies on there are E. coli that are expressing different mutants of gas vesicles. And we have a robotic scanner that's moving around this ultrasound transducer and automatically generating images, and so now in high throughput, we can, we can do genetic screening uh, with, um, with ultrasound. All right, so <clears throat> that's what I wanted to, to, to mention about um, ultrasound, and uh, you know, I, th I thought for this audience, it would be criminal not to talk a bit about um, MRI, given how much interest uh, there is here. Um, and MRI, um, I think everybody here knows, is, is a really beautiful uh, technique that takes advantage of nuclear spin uh, behavior. And these are just a few of the main uh, methods that people use to acquire imaging from the tissue itself. And people have developed contrast agents that can produce these different kinds of contrast. And uh, before I started thinking about um, ultrasound reporter genes, about uh, 15 years ago, um, I and a bunch of other people uh, started thinking about reporter genes for MRI. And when we first were doing that, we were quite literally saying, okay, let's look at our main synthetic reporter genes and try to emulate them in proteins. Okay, so we have paramagnetic chelates or we have magnetic uh, nanomaterials. And so we looked for proteins that looked similar. So things naturally that came up from that were ferritin, which produces iron oxide uh, inside of a protein nanostructure, or heme proteins, uh, which I worked on, that can uh, chelate iron. And you know, this allowed us to produce nice proof of concept studies, but I think it's fair to say that the world isn't like out there using MRI reporter genes uh, in basic biology, even though there's a pretty large installed base of uh, animal uh, MRI instruments. And part of the reason for that is that the sensitivity is still quite limited, right? So you need, if you're doing metals, you need, you know, tens of micromolar of that metal for you to see the contrast. And that metal may not be available um, everywhere. Um, and so over the last few years, we've said, okay, well, let, let's see if we can get away from this metal concept and try to come up with other contrast mechanisms for MRI. So one of them is using gas, okay? And this is the last thing I'll mention about gas vesicles, and then I'll move on to, to something else. Um, and so George Liu, who joined my lab, uh, said, well, in, when you're doing ultrasound contrast, you're taking advantage of the fact that air has a different acoustic impedance relative to its surrounding medium. But air also has a different magnetic susceptibility. And if you take a particle like this that um, has that susceptibility difference and put it into a strong magnetic field, then around every one of those particles, you're going to generate magnetic field gradients. Um, and if you have a bunch of these particles at some concentration and volume, you're going to generate macroscale field gradients that may, may be visible by quantitative susceptibility mapping, whereas here you could see it by T2. And so we tried it, and it turned out that these air-filled nanostructures could be very nicely seen by T2 and T2 star-weighted uh, MRI and by QSM, 
at concentrations that are in the picomolar, hundreds of picomolar range, and about 25 micrograms per mil in terms of the protein concentration. And just for reference, a typical cell has 150 milligrams per mil of total protein. So we're not asking the cell uh, to make that much, and there's no metal involved. So that was great. But perhaps an even more interesting thing is that uh, the gas vesicles, we have a way of overcoming what's really a significant problem in T2 uh, contrast agent imaging, which is that you have all this background contrast. So when you see a dark spot, can you really tell if it's coming from your contrast agent or something else uh, that's present there? And that's illustrated in this phantom where we have gas vesicles at a couple different concentrations, but we also just have mismatched concentrations of agarose, or we have a little rod with nickel in it that's producing the shadow in the background. And it's very hard to tell where the gas vesicles are and how abundant they are. And so here, we can take advantage of the combination of MRI and ultrasound. Okay? And the role of ultrasound here is that we can apply a brief ultrasound pulse. It doesn't even have to be an imaging transducer. And if the pressure is high enough, that's going to cause the gas vesicles to collapse. And that should erase its MRI contrast. Okay? And so we can apply it in this phantom here, where this is the before image. We apply ultrasound. We see signal where the gas vesicles were present changing. And by doing a simple difference image, we can now very nicely make out where we have gas vesicles and how much is present. And this is easily applied in vivo. There are uh, MRI compatible ultrasound transducers. Here we're doing it in the brain. We put gas vesicles into a particular part of the brain. We see this black spot under T2 imaging. We apply ultrasound. Bam, that spot gets erased. And then we can map the difference on top of the anatomical background and very nicely tell where those things are. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is diffusion um, <clears throat> and not gas vesicles. Um, and uh, you know, I couldn't have a better introduction to diffusion than, than having uh, Daniel Ebian um, uh, talk about it. But um, and it's been very powerful. But until recently, there hadn't really been a reporter a, a um, contrast agent, synthetic or genetic, for diffusion-weighted imaging. And we said, well, there's this elegant technique. Is it possible to come up with a reporter gene that you could see by DWI? And uh, that turned out to be feasible because one of the things that determines diffusivity, at, at least on, on the relevant you know, time scales of about 100 milliseconds, is the cell membrane. Okay? And so we came up with the idea of increasing the permeability of the cell membrane by overexpressing this very simple protein called aquaporin. It's present in virtually all of our cells to some level and present across the different domains of life. And it is a water channel. It sits in the membrane and allows water molecules to go in and out. It's not pumping them, so it's just a passive diffusion mechanism. Remarkable protein. Each one of these things can conduct a billion water molecules per second. Okay. Um, and uh, there had been some uh, hints in the literature that endogenous expression of aquaporin could influence uh, MRI contrast. And so we had this very simple idea of let's just overexpress aquaporin. When we do that, water diffusivity on average in the, in the tissue overexpressing it should uh, increase, and we should be able to see the contrast on DWI. And if true, then here again we have no metal requirement. This is a nice autologous protein, so unlike our gas vesicles, which is a foreign protein. Um, so this could potentially be even easier to translate, ultimately. And the mechanism is orthogonal to all the T1 and T2 reporters and contrast agents that people have been developing. Um, and this turned out to work even better than we expected. So here we're looking at three different cell lines. We're looking at cell pellets, in this case, where we're overexpressing either aquaporin or GFP as a negative control. This is a diffusion-weighted image with a big delta of uh, 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 about 100 milliseconds, um, where we see this beautiful darkening uh, diffusion-weighted contrast in uh, aquaporin overexpression. And then we can do the same kind of genetic circuit test where we have this doxycycline as an input, and we're looking at, we're modulating the expression of aquaporin, and as we increase the amount of this drug, we see darker and darker and darker uh, contrast. So it wor worked out uh, very well. And we can also do it in vivo. Um, so here we're doing a simple uh, tumor model inside the brain. And uh, we have, again, a tumor that it can be triggered to express aquaporin or triggered to express GFP. When we first look at the tumors, because they're highly cellularized on diffusion-weighted imaging, they look very bright in both of their cases. But then when we give the doxycycline, the one that is overexpressing aquaporin darkens because diffusion uh, is now easier, and this works quite robustly across animals. Now, for some reason, which I don't understand based on basic 
kind of physical and physiological principles, people seem to be concerned about overexpressing aquaporin. Maybe some of you are concerned about it. Are you going to make the cell swell, right? You're not making the cell swell because it's, it's a passive channel. The water just goes in and out. Nothing is getting, is getting pumped. So the only time where aquaporin expression is deleterious is if you're under osmotic imbalance, in which case the water is going to rush in more quickly. But if you're under osmotic imbalance, you're going to die anyway. This is just accelerating it uh, by a little bit. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, we showed in uh, four different assays um, that overexpressing aquaporin has no impact on cell viability, uh, and showed in vivo that uh, tumors that express aquaporin look the same on the cellular scale and grow the same uh, if you implant them subcutaneously. So I think it's, it's a pretty good uh, reporter gene to use. So uh, in summary, um, you know, we're really trying to develop ways to um, image cells inside the body. Right? And the idea is that for basic biology, you know, we have great ways to manipulate cells uh, on the outside and introduce them, or to create transgenic animals that we can put in what, whatever genes we want. Um, and for uh, medicine, uh, we and others are interested in using cells as our diagnostic and therapeutic agents. And we need better ways to communicate with those cells. And we think using sound waves and magnetic fields is an excellent way to do that. And I showed you uh, a couple examples on the imaging side of using these, uh, these uh, forms of energy and coupling them to unique and in some case unusual uh, biomolecules that have the right physics to interact with these forms of energy. Um, and you can do similar stuff actually for controlling cellular function, which I unfortunately don't have time to talk about today. So with that, um, I'd like to first uh, thank my group. Um, as you might imagine, this is quite a multidisciplinary uh, effort. And at Caltech, we're very lucky to have uh, p excellent people across uh, all the different disciplines. This is a photo from our, our recent uh, beach party. Um, I'm always recruiting uh, talented people who want to join, uh, join our lab. Uh, of course, our funding sources, collaborators, and uh, thank you again for the invitation and for your attention. Well, thank you for this very interesting talk. I'm sure there are some questions. Now, just um, uh, we have tried also uh, to play with aquaporin in the future, mm -hmm. but uh, the opposite, we are, we are blocking yep. aquaporin channels using uh, my TGN20. Mm -hmm. And what we see, in fact, uh, is that there is an impact on, on, on the diffusion uh, parameters, mm -hmm. versus non-version diffusion. But uh, what is, is nice is that uh, there is no effect on, on cell swelling, as mm -hmm. exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. What we see is the effect of flammability. Yeah. So water molecules can exchange, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this has some impact that we can be detected uh, uh, with, with the human mm -hmm. But uh, as you might know, um, permeability of cells to water uh, might give us some information, for instance, in, in cancer tissues. Yeah. So it's depending on what is expressed on the <coughs> cell surface, mm -hmm. uh, might have uh, give us some information about uh, the sensitivity of some uh, uh, tissues yes. to, to drugs, to, to chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, so you, you are overexpressing yeah. we are blocking. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think, um, so you know, we're also uh, kind of playing around with that a little bit. Um, and I think you could go both ways because you have a baseline diffusivity. So, you know, your choice to go up or down. And in some tissues, like the brain, actually, you might want to go for the reduction because you already have a pretty high, uh, pretty high baseline. Um, the cells, what I find fascinating about aquaporin is that some cells really need a high expression of it. And these are cells that need to deform a lot. Uh, and so red blood cells have a ton of aquaporin on their surface. And uh, certain tumors, as they try to become more metastatic, also start overexpressing aquaporin. So it is possible in some cells that if you knock down aquaporin, you might affect their physiology. Um, but overexpressing may be a little bit safer in those, in those contexts. A little bit along the same line, but um, can you show the tumors grow similarly? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, have you gone a little bit more? Um, well, let's say risky analysis, uh, or transcriptome analysis, all of these techniques, you know, you can say they don't impact, they will impact cross. Yeah. Uh, Is that something you're, you're or you, you want to stay away from? That? Well, no, I think we're not, we're not afraid to look under the rug. Uh, but, um, yeah, I think that really needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, right? So here it was kind of proof of concept. We're doing tumors. Um, one study that we're doing that's not, not published yet is um, trying to use aquaporin to track CAR T cells. Okay? And in that case, we can ask, well, how does overexpression occur? 
impact the ability of those cells to do their job, right? So not just survival, but ability to uh, kill uh, tumor cells and so on. And they seem to be doing just fine in doing that. Now, are we affecting their transcriptome? Almost certainly. And I think actually, if you look even with fluorescent proteins, any time that you ask a cell to make a foreign protein that imposes some metabolic burden on the cell that um, it would prefer not to have. Um, so yeah, but uh, you know, I guess it, there's a, a cost benefit analysis. Um, for doing that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Great. Have a small present. Thank you. There's some aquaphor and channel. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.